Hello, and welcome to this session of the 15th Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Detol Baniga Swas India. The session is presented by the Hawthornden Trust. It's our pleasure to present the Island of Missing Trees, Elif Shafa in conversation with Nandini Nair. Award-winning author and activist Elif Shafak's latest novel, The Island of Missing Trees, is a delicate tribute to the agony of war, displacement, and undying hope. The novel follows the journey of two displaced Cypriot lovers and a fig tree, which remains the only connection to their lost home, the only symbol of their inherited identity, which they may pass on to their child. In conversation with Nandini Nair, Shafak explores the essence of identity, memory, and generational trauma. Elif Shafak is an award-winning British-Turkish novelist. She's published 19 books, 12 of which are novels, including her latest, The Island of Missing Trees, shortlisted for the Costa Novel Award. Shafak is a fellow and a vice president of the Royal Society of Literature, a member of the We Forum Global Agenda Council on Creative Economy. Elif Shafak is an award-winning British-Turkish novelist. She's published 19 books, 12 of which are novels, including her latest, The Island of Missing Trees, shortlisted for the Costa Novel Award. Shafak is a fellow and a vice president of the Royal Society of Literature, a member of the We Forum Global Agenda Council on Creative Economy, and a founding member of the European Council on Foreign Relations an advocate for women's rights, LGBTQ plus rights, and freedom of expression. Shafak is an inspiring public speaker and two-time TED Global Speaker. Nandini Nair is the literary and cultural editor of Open Magazine. She's worked as a writer and commissioning editor in the feature section of the Indian Express and the Hindu. Nair predominantly writes on social and cultural issues. Please feel free to send in your comments by typing them in the comment section. Please do follow our social media handles to get notifications on the upcoming sessions. Do tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2022 and tag at Jaipur Lit Fest. Ladies and gentlemen, the island of missing trees, Elif Shifa, in conversation with Nandini Nair. Hi, Elif. It's wonderful to be back here with you again. Uh, thank you, JLF, for having us. Um, I don't think Elif needs any introduction, so I'm just going to go straight into the conversation with her, which is about this wonderful book. Um, I have my very dog-eared copy here with a lot of post-its and notes <laughs> because it's a book that I absolutely cherish. Um, so, Elif, I think my first question to you, I think I'm just going to start off immediately, um, actually draws from one of your previous books, um, The 40 Rules of Love. Uh, and there you, in the acknowledgements, you have this wonderful line where you thank your uh, partner and children and you say, um, I thank you for sh showing me a nomadic soul that it was possible to settle down in one place and still be free. Uh, and I think that acknowledgement in some way captures the essence of this book as well, uh, which is about being nomadic, it's about being free, and it's also about love. Um, so if you could just sort of talk a little bit about all of that. <laughs> Oh, what a beautiful question. I, 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 may I start by saying I'm, I'm really very happy to see you and, and very happy that we're doing this together, sharing the same platform. Uh, I also am very much looking to coming to Jaipur, you know, in person. Uh, that, that has been in, in my heart for a very long time. Uh, it's interesting because there are some underground tunnels that connect books, aren't there? Maybe they're not visible at first glance, but I think they're very much there. So for me, this duality of settling down versus a more peripatetic, a more nomadic lifestyle, I think has been very crucial, that distinction. Also because of the way I grew up, um, I have lived in different cities, different cultures. And, and I think, especially in my early youth, I thought I would never be able to settle down uh, ever, even though I feel very attached to Istanbul. Even in Istanbul, I felt a bit like an insider outsider, always on the edge, the threshold, uh, maybe enough of an insider to love and feel attached, but also always you retain a little bit of cognitive distance. So always you feel a little bit of an outsider wherever you go. So I, what I'm trying to say is, I guess, um, I, I care about these questions of belonging, 
you know, being being part of something, but also feeling like an immigrant, exile, can we have multiple belongings? All these questions matter a lot to me. I cannot claim that I have solved the duality <laughs> completely, um, yeah. but it's something that I very much care about. And I think it's very visible in my writing. Great. Um, so the book, um, The Island of Missing Trees, for those of you who have not read it, and I urge you all to read it, um, is about two star-crossed lovers, as they say. Uh, there's Daphne and Costas. Uh, please correct me if I get the pronunciations wrong. Um, so Daphne is Turkish Muslim and Costas is Greek Christian. Um, that's, of course, a very sort of simplistic way of putting the plot. But what, I've, what is, uh, I think, most compelling about the novel is that the central character, in a way, is a fig tree. Um, and the story is told from the perspective of a fig tree, in a way, which has witnessed the relationship and has seen how they came together and then how they came apart as well. Um, so, Elif, could you just talk us a little bit about um, finding this fig tree? Because I know you've said that once you knew you could tell the story from the perspective of fig tree, the novel sort of fell into place. That's, that's very true, um, because I've been wanting to write about Cyprus for a very long time. And for those who are very familiar with the island, um, may I just very quickly say, this is a beautiful island with beautiful people north and south, but at the same time, it's a place that has experienced partition, division, war and ethnic violence and as we are speaking there's a line there there's a border that is guarded by united Nations troops which literally separates christians from muslims and greek cypriots from turkish cypriots so it divides across ethnic lines and religious lines at the same time and it's not a, it's not an easy story to tell also because the past is not a bygone affair I think the past is very much alive in this present moment. So there are wounds, but the wounds are unhealed. And therefore it's a challenge for a, for a writer. How do you even approach such a complicated story without yourself falling into the trap of nationalism, without yourself falling into the trap of tribalism? I was not able to find that door, that opening, you know, that gate that would take me into the story. And so for a very long time, I've been thinking, writing notes, taking notes, um, researching, but keeping it to myself. Only when I found the voice of the fig tree, then the pieces came together um, and connected. Only then I felt, a, you know, a bit more courageous, if I may put it this way, to start telling the story. So, in other words, the fig tree gave me a completely different perspective and the door, the gate that I was looking for. Um, at the start of this answer, you mentioned the line that separates the Greeks from the Turks. Um, and I think the novelist mentioned how this is called the green line, um, which is kind of a sad irony because um, green is the color of verdancy in nature and this it's a border. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how about the green line? Yeah, there's a, there's a moment in the book when the tree talks about particularly the, the, this green line. It's called green because um, when, when the British officer who divided, who drew the line, uh, when he was drawing it on a map, he used a green pen, basically. <laughs> so it's, it's a green line. But of course, all these lines are so arbitrary. And again, from a tree's perspective, you know, it, it makes such a big difference because one tree stays on the other side of the border and another tree stays on this side of the border, which is, of course, what we can say also for human beings. Um, but fast forward, I think uh, one of the things that I would love to talk about is that there's a bicommunal organization in Cyprus, if I may mention that. It's called the Committee on Missing Persons. And I have a lot of respect for these people. Many of them are women, many of them are volunteers. It was launched by the United Nations, but it's the Cypriots who are doing the real work. And they're working together, people from both sides of the border. And what they're doing, doing is they're digging the ground to find the bones of people who went missing during the time of the Troubles. And the reason why they're excavating is not because they want to revive old animosities or hostilities, just the opposite. They want to give the dead a proper burial, you know, find the people who are buried in mass graves as well. Uh, dignity, give the dead dignity, and the families a possibility for healing and a sense of closure. 
So the reason why I mentioned this is because I think it is not possible to have reconciliation and peace without memory. Memory matters. We cannot repair what we don't remember. And if we don't remember, uh, and if we don't repair, then we're bound to repeat the same mistakes. Um, since you mentioned this, um, a lot of this book is essentially about the burying of the fig tree and the unburying of the fig tree, uh, which probably ties in with the fact of the work of this um, committee, right? Because they are, like you mentioned, they're excavating uh, bones and the importance of the work that they're doing is which, which is to give back families what they've lost, to give them some sort of closure in a way. Um, so when you were writing uh, this book, could you tell us a little bit about the bearing and the unbearing? Yes, it's, it's so important throughout the story. Um, as you know, one of the, not, not only metaphorically, but one of the crucial components of the story is when the fig tree is being buried. And this is a botanical technique uh, that I came across first when I lived in America, in Michigan. I used to be a visiting scholar there in Ann Arbor, and the winters were very cold. And I remember meeting some Italian-American families who would bury their fig trees. So that stayed with me and I started doing more research and I realized that actually immigrants who come from war warmer lands or warmer climates into colder climates and uh, immigrants who are very fond of their fig trees, many of them, especially the elderly, the older generation, they continue, they're still keeping up with this botanical tradition or technique. Uh, and what they do basically is they dig a trench in the ground, they bury, they push the tree after pruning it gently into the ground and cover it with organic material like straw or earth. Uh, and the idea is to keep the tree warm there. And when the spring comes, you unbury the tree. And of course, that theme of burial and unburial is incredibly important if you're telling the story of Cyprus, because there are still so many untold stories uh, out there. And the second thing that I can mention in that regard is there are many untold stories also within immigrant families or any family that comes from a complicated background. We always talk about family stories, but I think we, we also need to pay attention to family silence. Um, in this novel, for example, the parents, uh, especially the mother, is a bit worried about how much her daughter should know. Um, and her sort of way of protecting her daughter is that she should know less. Um, and I think the daughter revolts against this in her own way. Um, so could we tell, talk a little bit about um, how much do you reveal as a parent? <laughs> That's a beautiful question. Again, a tough one, too, because, you know, it's, it's an emotional subject, isn't it, when we talk about the past? What I have observed is on both sides of the Atlantic, especially when I look at immigrant families, um, the first generation, the elderly are the ones who have experienced the biggest hardships, obstacles, sometimes even traumas, but they don't have a language to talk about these things. And so they keep it inside. The second generation is not that interested in the past, understandably because they're busy building a new life they have to be forward-looking future-oriented they need to find their feet so the past is not their primary concern but then interestingly it's the third or the fourth generations in these families in other words the youngest in these mm -hmm. families who are asking the sharpest strongest questions about identity memory their ancestors journeys so you can come across young people carrying old memories or willing to understand these old memories. In my case, I think because I'm a novelist, I try to understand the perspective of each generation. Uh, and personally, I'm someone who believes that sharing is important uh, because untold stories keep us apart and what we repress actually comes back. Uh, but of course, when I say this, I'm aware that it's not that easy and emotionally it's challenging for every generation. Um, it's interesting how in the novel, uh, the name of the young uh, girl is Ada, which means island, right? Yes. Uh, um, so she is an island herself. Um, and do you think... That... <laughs> That's so true, actually. I mean, she's an island herself. Um, but, but, but honestly, I think it's, we live in an age in which it's not easy to be young. Okay. So I feel like East and West, everywhere we go across the world, it feels like almost there's a scream building up inside young people. 
And many of them feel like the, the previous generations, the el older generations have screwed up everything and we're leaving them a broken world. And they see this and they don't have the power at the moment to change it. So that, that increases their sense of frustration. Now, in the case of other, on top of this, on top of the difficulties, the challenges of being young in an age such as ours, because she comes from such a complicated background and she comes from a family with lots of silences, I think that too adds up into the pressure that she carries inside. So she's curious, uh, she has questions and she wants to know more, but she's met with silences and that too frustrates her. Um, so in fact, the novel very early on starts with Ada having a sort of um, an incident in the classroom where she yells out this guttural scream. Um, so in a way, is that what you're mentioning, a personification of what the youth in a way are going through today? Uh, this inability of dealing with what is thrown at them because so much is thrown at them in terms of social media and the pressures, etc. And probably even parents who don't always understand them. That's true. So much is thrown at them. And um, there's a, a lot of anxiety, you know, um, weighing on their shoulders and lots of uncertainties. Again, when we look at our grandmother's generations, of course, they went through lots and lots of challenges throughout cultural history, political history. People have experienced all kinds of difficulties, sometimes poverty, depression, on top of partitions, violence and so on. But interestingly, they always, almost always, retain the belief that tomorrow would be better than yesterday. <laughs> My grandmother, she, she wasn't very well educated. She had been denied a proper education for being a girl. She wholeheartedly believed in women's education. And so she believed that if you give your children a better education, they will have better job opportunities, a better life uh, you know, prospects for, for themselves. So... What we've lost today is that kind of faith that tomorrow is going to be better than yesterday. At a time of climate destruction and climate emergency, when we're losing our only home, our only planet, when we see, you know, pandemics, when we see widening inequalities, you know, so much is interlinked. At a time like this, nobody says, and especially when AI is, you know, moving so fast, the job market is shifting so much, we don't know if the education we're providing right now is going to be relevant in the next 50 years. So at a moment like this, nobody says, well, if I give a better education to my child, they're going to have, you know, lots of job opportunities or tomorrow the world is going to be better than yesterday. And that too adds to our existential angst. There is an existential anxiety that is affecting everyone, but definitely much more young people. So I really believe there's a scream building up. Um, as a parent and as a novelist, um, how might this faith in the younger generation be restored? Like just hazarding a, a guess in a way. We need to understand that this is a moment of change. We are at a crossroads and the narratives need to change. Our political structures need to change. Societies need to change because there's lots of inequalities. Uh, sometimes people with all the good intentions, they say, when are we going to go back to the normal, the way things were before the pandemic. But I want to question that. Was it really normal the way things were before the pandemic? So, so many people feel voiceless. So many people feel left out. And I think that's important. We need to care about inequality and inequality is plural. So I believe we need to listen to young people more. We like to tell them what they should be doing but we, we're not willing to listen to them. So we need to become better listeners. I think especially my generation need to learn to listen better. Um, what you said just reminded me of a line uh, where you talk about how um, cartography, cartography is another name for stories told by winners um, and for stories told by those who have lost, there isn't one. Um, so is this kind of what you're saying about how those in an unequal world, only certain voices are amplified and many important voices are rendered invisible? That is very true. And I think this is why we need literature. We need culture and arts, because for me, the way I see it, I think literature pays more attention to the periphery rather than the center. Of course, as writers, we love stories. We love language, words. 
but we're equally, I personally, I'm equally drawn to silences. So the things that are not told, the things that I cannot find in written culture, to clarify it, maybe I can also mention that I, being Turkish, I come from a country that has a very long and rich history. That doesn't necessarily translate into strong memory. In Turkey, I think it's quite the opposite. We are a society of collective amnesia. And our entire relationship with the past is full of ruptures. So when there's a void, that void is usually filled in by ultranationalists, Islamists, interpretations of the past that talk about a nostalgic you know, empire or an imperial nostalgia, which, which longs for the golden age, you know, when we were so mighty. I want to question that. The, the story of the empire changes depending on who is telling the story and who is not allowed to tell the story. So if you ask women in the empire, they will tell you a different story. If you ask the minorities, you know, people whose voices we almost never ever come across in written culture. And I think we also need to pay attention to oral culture because sometimes oral culture is the keeper of memories that are erased by written culture. And I want my work to bridge these two worlds. So all I'm trying to say is I find it very important that literature should bring the periphery to the center and rehumanize people who have been dehumanized. Um, it's so interesting that you mentioned that because I think um, India is similarly a country of collective amnesia, as you say, um, these sort of Asian countries that choose to like you said, rupture, have a relationship which is one of rupture with the past. Uh, but why do you think that is the case? Why do we? Why are we so intentionally forgetful? Um, on the one hand, I think part of it is understandable because these are societies that have gone through so much turbulence, so much you know breaking points, and then in order to have a new start you have to believe that it's tabula rasa, you have a clean slate, you know, and, and you, you're beginning anew. I understand that urge, but if we, if we ignore memory, if we ignore the responsibilities that come with memory, we can never grow up, we can never be mature, you know, as individuals and as communities and societies. Memory is a responsibility, we need to learn we need to face both the beauties, but also the, uh, the dark side of our own histories. And we need to share the, the sorrow. You know, we, we need to understand and become better listeners. So my point is we need more nuanced, pluralistic readings of history. At the end of the day, you might say every nation state has its own official version of things. And in that regard, there isn't that much of a difference between one country and another. But where there is a difference is in a country where there's a pluralistic, inclusive democracy, you can easily walk into a bookstore and come across many books that question official historiography, the official narrative. And the authors of those books are not arrested. The authors of those books are not prosecuted. In a country where there's no democracy, like in Turkey, we have, we've lost what little freedom of speech we had, Whenever you challenge official narrative, immediately you are labeled as a traitor, as a betrayer. So it becomes very difficult to breathe for writers. For me, pluralism is important. And you will only do this if you really love your country. You know, people say, oh, if you question the, the narrative, then you don't love your country. Just the opposite. If you really care about your land, if you really care about the culture where you come from, of course you want it to be better. And of course, then, only then, you put efforts into excavating the untold stories. Um, as a Turkish author, um, it's impossible to be uh, non-political. Um, what did you mean by that? And do you think your role, you feel like as you sort of get more and more international recognition, um, that role has become more burdensome or do you think it's become more powerful over time? It's very difficult because by nature, I'm an introvert, you know? I think like many novelists, I, I, I don't like the public space that much and I would rather just stay in my room with my books, with my notebooks, in, inside my own imaginary world. That's easier for me. But at the same time, 
I have understood early on in my literary journey that if you happen to be a storyteller from a broken democracy, such as Turkey, such as Brazil, and that list is actually getting longer and longer today, then you do not have the luxury of being non-political. And what I mean by that is when so much is happening outside the window, you cannot say, I don't want to talk about what's going on outside the window. I only want to talk about my poetry. I only want to talk about my fiction. You can't say that. At least about core issues such as human rights, women's rights, LGBTQ plus rights, rule of law, uh, the loss of media freedoms. There are some core issues about which we cannot be silent. Also, I am a feminist. I've learned many wonderful things from uh, feminist movements of past generations. And of course, one of the central things is that politics, we need to redefine politics. Politics is not only what Boris Johnson said today, what the, you know, the parliament happened in the UK, what happened yesterday. Politics is more than that. Wherever there is a power imbalance, there is politics there. And in that regard, the personnel is also political. So you might be writing about sexuality. You might be writing about gender discrimination. That too is political. Now defined in such a broad way, uh, writers, especially novelists who deal with a bigger canvas of ideas, novelists cannot be apolitical. But when I say this, I don't mean that politics is my guide and I do not like party politics. I don't like partisan politics at all. All I'm saying is writers have to ask political questions, but always leave the answers to the reader. Mm -hmm. And for you to be able to do that, literature is our guide. The art of storytelling is our guide. But within a novel, there's always politics. Wonderful. Thank you for such an articulate answer. Um, you mentioned how you are a feminist, and I know you've always said how you were raised by two strong women, your mother and your grandmother. Um, so what were your early encounters with feminism? What has that journey been like? And I think the relationship between sort of storytelling and feminism. Indeed, indeed. And I think it, it left a big impact on me because um, being raised by two women, also not being raised in a typical traditional patriarchal Turkish family, uh, that too left a big impact on me and my writing. Very quickly, I can say I was born in France to Turkish parents. My parents got separated afterwards and my father stayed in France. He got married again. And I grew up without seeing him for a very long time. I met my half brothers in my mid twenties. So there was something broken there for a very, very long time. In the meantime, I was raised by two very strong women. I was brought to Turkey, to Ankara by my mother, but my grandmother's house, my maternal grandmother's house, where I was brought into, uh, was, a, in, was in a very conservative, in a very patriarchal, very religious and inward looking neighborhood. So I didn't feel like we fit in in that environment at all. But grandma's house was different. Her house was very matriarchal. And that house was full of superstitions, folk tales, you know, pe what people might call irrational, uh, this, you know, the spiritual elements of life. I like that. I felt connected to that. I, I, grew, I grew up observing these two women, uh, but I can also say from my mother, I got my love for written culture. And from, from my grandmother, I got my love for oral culture, oral traditions. And what really stayed with me is the solidarity between these two women. I'm a big believer in sisterhood. And I think when and if women manage to support each other, the impact of that goes beyond generations. So had my grandmother not supported my mother's independence, because as a divorcee, uh, you're immediately stigmatized in a patriarchal society. You know, if, if my grandmother hadn't supported her independence, our lives would have been completely different. So women have to support each other. And I think solidarity and sisterhood is needed even more today. Um, I think in the novel, uh, there's a, um, a beautiful example of a sort of a growing solidarity between the aunt and the niece. Um, so initially when they approach each other, at least in the niece's eyes, uh, they're antagonists, but then by the end they have a relationship. Um, and I think in the novel, it's also interesting how, um, like you mentioned, there's a certain um, regard for superstition, right? You don't disregard it completely. Um, you realize that 
uh, it is a bedrock of many families in a way and of many histories. Um, so can we talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how you've approached uh, superstition um, in a rational way? <laughs> um, of course, I mean, I, I, I love books. I love culture. I love knowledge, information. Uh, or actually, I make a distinction between information, knowledge, and wisdom. I think we need to focus more on knowledge and wisdom. But my point is, sometimes people in the intellectual world look down upon oral culture, and I don't like that. Uh, as you said, there is there is a bedrock there. There is something there that has been transmitted from one generation to the next. You don't need to agree, but we we need to try to understand where it comes from. Sometimes superstitions come from our deepest fears. So I need to understand where those fears come from as well as a writer. Also, I'm interested in those things that travel beyond borders. So coming back to the island of missing trees, to the island of Cyprus, if you look at the religions on both sides, especially the religious on both sides, they clash all the time. But if you look at the superstitions on the island, actually superstitions travel across the border. So mm -hmm. you observe a Greek Cypriot grandmother and then observe a Turkish Cypriot grandmother. And the similarities are amazing, especially in their practices of superstitions. The way they want to ward off the evil eye, they, the way they want to protect their loved ones. You know, very human, very genuine and understandable. So. I, I like to follow things such as superstitions, such as food. Food is also a language that travel beyond these borders of nationalism, ethnicity or religiosity that the mind takes for granted. But when you follow the culture, the history of food or superstitions, then the, the entire picture changes. Uh, talking about food, I think in the novel, it's uh, fascinating how um, at the tavern, uh, the tavern which is called the Happy Fig, the entire menu is given. Um, and then I think even the figure of the aunt, uh, she's cooking a lot. And that's the way she sort of shows her culture to her niece, especially who's kind of dismissive about her baklava and about her stuffed um, peppers. Uh, so can we talk a little bit about uh, the importance of food and uh, food and identity in a way and how um, when it comes to a place like Cyprus uh, where there is the Greeks and there is the Turkish but there is probably a common food culture as well. Definitely I mean I, I, I honestly think food is always more than food it's 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 a way of communication and there are people like Mariam and I, I feel like I know these women uh, again I was raised by such women for my grandmother as well food was the way she expressed herself. Sometimes they want to tell you so much, but they don't know how. So instead they feed you, these women, you know? They set up a table and they, they want to feed you. That's the way they express their feelings. I also love the way food travels beyond these divisions. I mean, in the Middle East we have this, or, or the Levant, I should say, we have these baklava wars. We Turks love to we like to believe that we make the best baklava. But of course, the Lebanese say our baklava is better. And the Syrians say, no, we make the best baklava. And the Greeks say, no way, our baklava is the best. And of course, it's nobody's baklava, right? It's, it's everyone's. Because historically, when you look at it, it has traveled. That's the beauty of it. That's the power of it. So I like to focus on that. I also believe, maybe a bit like Mariam, if we could break bread together if we could maybe share food or water together and look each other in the eye, right. maybe there would be less misunderstandings and less quarrels in the world. So it makes a huge difference when you can share your food with someone. Um, at the end of uh, this book, there is a glossary and sort of looking at the glossary to me, it seemed a bit like a list of ingredients as well, uh, because the glossary had a uh, Greek words, it has Arabic words, it has Turkish words. Um, and I think in your previous books as well, you have used glossaries, uh, and especially as a writer who started writing in Turkish and then now writes in English. Can we talk a little bit about uh, language and your uh, decisions to have these glossaries? Yes, I, I love language. I mean, uh, you might say it goes without saying, but sometimes, especially for novelists, language can be a secondary concern. That never was the case for me from the very beginning. 
I see language as a space, as a zone I enter in and I inhale rather than an instrument that I use and then set aside. So I want to be inside language, you know? And even when I was writing in Turkish primarily, my earlier novels were all written in Turkish first, even then I would be using a much richer, if I may put it this way, language than the one we use in our daily lives in Turkey. And what I mean by that is in Turkey, we have Turkified our language. Mm. The Ottoman Empire being a multilingual, multi-ethnic empire <clears throat> had a very um, eclectic mix of vocabulary. Uh, later on in time, we Turkified the language and we took out words coming from Arabic and Persian origin. So in a way, our vocabulary shrunk over time. Whereas I, as an author, I love to use both old words and new words. I think words live longer than us. And we don't have the right to say, you know, you're old now. <laughs> so I love these nuances. But basically what I'm trying to say is uh, writing in English afterwards was not an easy decision for me. It was more like an intuitive thing rather than a rational decision. I needed an, another space of freedom. Being a Turkish writer is very heavy. Being a women writer in Turkey is even heavier. And I needed a little bit of space, a little bit of distance and writing in English, even though it was a big challenge for me, gave me that sense of freedom. Of course, when I say this, I am aware, and as you can hear in my pronunciation and the mistakes that I make, I am not a native speaker. So for me, English is an acquired language, you know, and uh, there will always, when you're an immigrant, when you're a latecomer, there will always be a gap between the mind and the tongue. And the tongue will always try to catch up and the mind will run faster. <laughs> and that gap will always frustrate you. But at the same time, I think I feel attached to both languages. And this is something that nationalists do not understand. They say, oh, if you're writing in English, then you can't be called a Turkish writer anymore. So my point is we can be more nomadic if that's how we feel, if that comes naturally. My connection with English is more cerebral. My connection with Turkish is more emotional. And I realized over the years, if my writing has sorrow, melancholy, longing, I find these things much easier to express in Turkish. But humor, which I love and I adore, and irony and satire are always much easier in English. Uh, does that happen that you dream in both languages? I do, and it also depends. I mean, if I'm, um, if I'm in the middle of a novel and if I'm writing in English intensely, I definitely dream in English. But when I speak with my mother, you know, um, <laughs> I speak Turkish that day more than English, then I dream in Turkish. But most days I just jump back and forth in my dreams from one language to another. And many immigrants have told me, like living in other countries, uh, that they do that. They, they experience that as well. I also know, again, many people who, when they're angry, uh, they like to express their anger in a different language. You know? <laughs> That's also very interesting when we shift. Uh, and why, why does the mind do that? So actually, they're much more, those boundaries are more, much more uh, fluid than we recognize. Um, finally, I think we only have about a couple of minutes left, but I think my last question to you would be, um, and I think in one of your novels, you mentioned as well how um, language is, of course, our greatest gift as humans in a way, uh, but it's also a space of misunderstanding, right? We can, uh, a lot of uh, disagreements are caused because of misreading, mishearing, etc. cetera. Uh, but what for you is the language of love? Oh, beautiful question. <laughs> the language of love, I think... Uh, it's, it's the sound of water, it's the flow of water, and what I mean by that is change. Love requires change. That's why I think in the 40 rules of love, when it says, if we're the same person before and after we have loved, maybe we haven't loved enough. <laughs> love changes us, and we need to allow that change to happen. Also, I think for me, the language of love is freedom. Uh, love is not about possessiveness. You know, we say my wife, my husband, my partner, my boyfriend or girlfriend. There's a big emphasis there on my, as if the other person belongs to us. They do not. You know, they are free individuals. So where there's no freedom, where there's no equality, 
I don't think love can flourish there. And in that regard, the language or the requirement for love, I would say, is all extreme. Right. Oh, we have a minute left, so I will continue. I wanted that to be the last question, <laughs> but I think um, I, um, there was one uh, really interesting part which I loved about your novel when you write about the ants um, and about when you talk about the history of Cyprus, uh, one needs to mention um, what ants do. And there was this really evocative description um, about that. So maybe you can just end it, uh, talking about the importance of ants and how you came about that. <laughs> I think actually it's so, it's so important because human beings, the, the way we live in these societies of consumption and inequalities is that we like to think we're the center of the universe and we are superior to all other creatures and they're just irrelevant. They're small, insignificant. Now, from the perspective of a fig tree, actually, there's no such thing as an insignificant creature. Fig trees love and respect bats, fruit bats, or ants, or mice, you know, or birds, because they know that all these um, creatures, they, they help trees to pollinate. So if we as human beings uh, benefit from the fruits of a fig tree, we need to understand that so many other beings have contributed. My point is there's an ecosystem in which everything is interconnected, but we do not understand these connections as human beings. Uh, we need to stop seeing ourselves as superior to others or as the center of, of the universe. And we need to understand that we're only a small part of a very complex ecosystem. And in that regard, I think we have a lot to learn from trees. I think nature uh, teaches that the best, right? Definitely. Definitely. Uh and I think there is this uh, nice uh, quote that you have at the start about uh, by Neruda, um, how if you haven't been to a Chilean forest, you don't know the planet. <laughs> Absolutely, because I mean, trees, the way they communicate, the way they're connected both above and under the ground, um, it, it has a lot to, to teach us. Also, one thing we didn't talk about is uh, inherited pain. You know, there are very interesting studies that show Trees that have experienced some kind of trauma, like wildfire or droughts, respond differently to other traumas than the trees around them. Not only that, but saplings that have descended from trees that have experienced trauma also respond differently. So some transmit in My point is, of course, there's a remarkable body of work about trees and nature, especially in the last decades, but there's still so much we haven't discovered. And I really think we need to pay more attention and urgently reconnect with nature and, and learn more from trees. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Aleph. I think we're totally out of time, uh, but I think that's the best note to end on. We need to learn more from trees. Thank, uh, you. thank you, JLF. Uh, thank you for having us. Thank you for having us, JLF. Thank you. Thank you, Elif, and thank you, Nandini, for that engrossing conversation. The session is presented by the Hawthornton Trust. Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Please do stay logged on and continue to watch with us the series of exciting sessions, GLF Writer Shorts, featuring a stellar list of speakers and artists that have been specially curated for you. 